Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm John Lachowski, president of the Institute, and I welcome you to a very special occasion here. Uh, it, uh, as, it, for those of you who are new to the Institute, we are an independent graduate school of, uh, of international affairs and national security. Uh, we have uh, five master's degree programs, a doctoral program in national security affairs, uh, and we have 18 uh, graduate certificate programs in various specialized uh, fields. Uh, we have a faculty of scholar practitioners who have done what they teach, uh, and our student body is half recent college graduates and half mid-career professionals from all sorts of relevant parts of the international affairs and national security communities. Uh, one of the things that we teach here is cultural diplomacy, which unfortunately uh, the Washington foreign policy establishment does not think is uh, particularly important. Uh, the, the, uh, the establishment is, is concerned principally with relations with governments as opposed to relations with and influence over people. And uh, it puts all its strategic attention and funding into those things. Uh, but we here at IWP uh, who specialize in uh, uh, various neglected parts of statecraft, consider public diplomacy in general and the cultural diplomacy in particular to be of national strategic importance. Uh, and we'll be discussing some of this in the course of our event today. But it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce an old friend and colleague from my days of service in the government and, and some of my work uh, in the with the agency in which he worked, and that is to introduce John Robaletti. Uh, Dr. Robaletti is a concert pianist. He uh, has performed in 26 countries around the world, including uh, with some of the major uh, classical music venues. He has done individual recitals. He has played with major orchestras in Europe. He has recorded commercial uh, CDs of solo pieces. Uh, he is now, uh, a, a, has in, in the last few years, has been a professional actor and a member of the Screen Actors Guild. He has had the lead or supporting roles in nine independent films many of which were officially selected in film festivals around the United States and in Japan. Um, he has written, directed, and produced a 30-minute short comedy film entitled My Piano Lesson. And this year, uh, he's been named to the 26th Annual Screen Actors Guild Awards Nominating Committee uh, to determine the best male and female actors in drama and comedy for television. Uh, he has a master's in fine arts from UCLA, a doctor of musical arts from Catholic University of America, and he has studied at the École Normale de Musique in Paris. Um, he has served on the piano faculties of two uh, universities, given master classes around the world. Well, in 1981, uh, at the beginning of the Reagan administration, uh, the U.S. Information Agency director, uh, Charles Wick, uh, invited him to, uh, to become a political appointee at USIA. Uh, he started off his, all of his work uh, with, uh, with the Reagan administration by doing a piano recital uh, at President Reagan's inauguration. Uh, at USIA, he started the Artistic Ambassadors Program which in my view was a spectacular cultural diplomacy program that involved sending uh, top-notch American pianists uh, to 63 countries around the world. Uh, and uh, and I, I don't want to steal any more of John's thunder, but just let me say that he has written a truly wonderful book called Federal Pianist. Uh, it is a novel. And I happen to know who some of the characters in this novel are. Uh, uh, some of them are composite characters. 
Some of them have very funny names. And uh, an enormous part of this book has to do with um, the uh, dynamics of relations between political appointees and career officials at, uh, at the agency. But I thought that we would begin uh, by just watching a little brief recital by John. Uh, and Hannah, if you would be so good as to uh, just uh, get this. It will be one piece. It will be a brief one. But uh, it will give you an idea of John's virtuosity. And, uh, and, and, and it will be, I think, the most appropriate way of starting out uh, our event today. Thank you.
I don't think the guy that put that video together likes me very much. <laughs> Thank you, John, for that introduction. I used to live in Washington and its environs, and uh, in recent years I moved to California from whence I came for this event. And I've forgotten how serious this town is. My gosh, everybody is so serious, the face is serious, mean. And while I was waiting for this, through my introduction, I let my mind wander and I fantasized about a scandal. Imagine if there was a lecture or an address that was well publicized and um, it was on a serious subject, substantive, perhaps even probative, a serious venue, and people dressed up and full of anticipation and excitement. And the guy came out and did 30 minutes of one-liners in a comedy routine. Instead of talking about nuclear proliferation or public diplomacy, he said, Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the State Department, and I don't know what happened to the other half. <laughs> Just a steady patter of, you know, it's so hot today the door of Grant's tomb was open. I mean, I think that Jaws would be down to the floor. It'd be like a scene out of Mel Brooks's film producers. Now, why did I go there? I don't know exactly, other than to give you a window into the odd turns of my mind. And that, by the way, is a privilege of the elderly. You will learn that those below a certain age, nobody here, some of the kids <laughs> out there, um, after you get past a certain age, it's easier to say, what you really think and feel, more so than uh, when you were in a more youthful incarnation. Now, youthful is a great word, and uh, it's a great segue. I was wondering how I was going to transit into what I was supposed to talk about. Uh, I want to take you back to the 1980s, when I was young. and. In this town, I was brought into an historic administration through machinations that I had absolutely nothing to do with. Now, you've heard that I, I've written a book. A reviewer has said that it's biographical fiction, and Google has more or less locked that in, I noticed. But in truth, except for the last two and a half chapters, it's completely true irrespective of, of one or two details leading up. So what I wanted to do today is to give you a narrative about my book. You have heard it said that I wrote. This is not a big deal in Washington, because there are so many books. There must be a thousand books about government, policy, issues probably most of them snoozers. <laughs> but this book uh, is, not, is not like that. Um, I don't think. So, in giving you a narrative as to what book came out, what was the ethos, what was the predicate, that is more of an intellectual thing having to do with the comprehension and story, you know, dates and so forth, uh, as opposed to the book itself, which is an existential walk through the experience where you feel it, you touch it, and uh, it reveals itself as, as it goes along, um, hopefully. 
Now, I, I don't like to read from notes or read from a text, but in this case, I hope you'll indulge me because there are so many details and timelines and anecdotes that are not in my book. Um, when I started to write this, I, um, <clears throat> I had in mind a straight, pristine, and sexless narrative about my experiences, a sort of uh, documentary, if you will. But it kept turning into a dark comedy. <laughs> Sometimes uh, you have to give up and let nature take its course. So that's what we're left with is a satire, except, it, as I said earlier, it's preponderantly true. I, I don't say that my experiences in government are, are transferable to anyone that follows into service. God forbid that that occur. Um, because they were, they were very unique. But I do think that anyone going into government or even thinking about it ought to read this book. It's not Government 101, but rather a, a psychological profile of the culture of government. A city within a city with its own <coughs> values and behavioral patterns, depending on whether you're a political appointee or a civil servant or a foreign service diplomat. It also reveals through, through the daily meanderings of an innocent caught in the vortex of power, much of the endemic lunacy that is attached to the artery walls of this body politic. Also of interest is that the observations of this book may be heightened because its author is an artist, which means arguably that I might feel things more intensely than most, or notice things in detail that others might consign to a, a sort of jaded normalcy or routine confusion which didn't concern me. <clears throat> when I came into the United, United States Information Agency, which unfortunately is now defunct, in June of 1982, there were 51 other political appointees. What made me unique, so I was told by the Deputy Director, Mr. Gil Robinson, was that all the other appointees had been brought in from think tanks, recommendations, or the importuning of political godfathers. I, however, was the only one brought in at the behest of the top guy himself, the director of the agency who knew me personally, since he was, in fact, the closest friend of the President of the United States. This provided a link in the minds of others, a link starting with the President, then my boss, than me. <clears throat> Anything I did reflected on that link, and so I was closely watched. There were no, were no mistakes that could be made. It was the previous winter that I'd gotten that phone call from Charlie. I was a 32-year-old assistant professor of piano at a Podunk College in eastern Pennsylvania. He tracked me down through my parents. He said, I'm chairman of the inaugural committee for the new president. How would you like to play a recital at the inauguration? I said, sure. <laughs> then another call a few months later about his being named to head up a federal agency. Would I like to come in and do something? And to show you my naivete, I didn't know what the blue book was. I didn't. He said, I, re I remember. Go down there and take a look at the building. Well, that was code, you know, for see what you want to do, what kind of job. Or whatever. I didn't know. I said, I've seen buildings before. I don't, <laughs> I don't understand. Uh, so I thought about it, and I took the initiative to write a job proposal as so though that would be you know, of interest in the government when all these other available jobs and positions were already listed. I didn't know any of that. So I, I, I wrote a job proposal, I remember, in an all-night diner in Westchester, Pennsylvania, on legal pad, and then I typed it up the next day and I called it uh, the Artistic Ambassador Program, and 
I sent it snail mail to Charlie. A month later, he called, he hadn't received it, and rightly figured that it was intercepted by his palace guard. <clears throat> they considered it disruptive to the existing order, plus it would mean I would be there and have access to the director on the personal level. This was dangerous because they thought him unstable and would not allow anyone to break through the surrounding cone of control which they tried to impose. According to an article in Rolling Stone by Judy Backrock at that time, it was after this very conversation that Charlie yelled at his executive assistant saying, find it and get me that proposal or your ass is grass. <laughs> Unquote. <laughs> so that's how yours truly came in to the agency. I thought at the time it was just a building. But I soon found out that my friends and enemies were made before I even got it. Now here's a question. Why would anyone want to bring in a young classical pianist into a hardball executive agency which deals in foreign policy and reports directly to the White House? The short answer is as follows. When I was a student in California, I studied with a great and iconic artist teacher of piano in the Hollywood Hills, Audi Serco, who had been an assistant to Arthur Schnabel in Berlin. In fact, I came from Paris to do it. Charlie had called him for lessons, and Avi said, I don't teach people like you. And he recommended me instead uh, to help with pocket money. I never knew why Charlie had such a devotion to those le lessons, because he never practiced and never improved. <laughs> <laughs> but wherever I was thereafter, whatever part of the world, including London, he would track me down and want to fly me back for a lesson. He, he, was, he was truly addicted to it. As a political appointee, I would be free to give him lessons any time. <laughs> no other focus to my tenure was ever given, other than by myself and my ill-fated job proposal. I was really brought in as a political appointee with White House clearance to give piano lessons to the president's closest friend. <laughs> Did I ever do it? No except for one time during the waning weeks of the administration. The rest of my time was spent like a dog with a snake in its mouth trying to make the Artistic Ambassador Program happen. That's what my book's about. The nonsense and Byzantine antics of trying to start something without a budget or a staff, moving into the jaws of the monster, armed only with a good idea. Here's a little of what happened at the beginning. I was put in one of three bureaus of the agency with absolutely nothing to do. Briefing books about the USIA, what it was about, <clears throat> were brought into my office every day by people who had not read them. I was told if I ever talked to Charlie alone, I had to write down everything that was spoken and send it to the front office of the bureau. My mail was routinely opened in the event that Charlie and I were communicating in some other way. This was at the behest of the head of the Bureau, a presidential appointee, who wanted me isolated because of my direct access to Charlie. I decided to use that access to get the hell out of his Bureau. I wrote a memo, but could not use the secretarial pool in the outer office, as they would have turned the memo over to my enemies. There was a political appointee in the other Bureau who headed up a small office who believed in the program I wanted to create, he offered me comfort and support in his office if I could just cross the line to get there. <laughs> they even typed the escape memo for me, but said it had to go through their boss, another political presidential appointee, and the head of this new bureau. But he didn't want me around either, and sat on the memo. That's when I had to go to Charlie directly and say I was trying to get a memo to him, but someone was holding it up. He literally pinned me to the wall and said, who? Now, at that point, and at that moment, the heads of the bureaus and the top management of the agency were already there for what was called an ex-com meeting, lined up in the foyer like a shooting gallery. 
So I was able to point <laughs> to the culprit. <laughs> Charlie took him into his office, and the shouting and verbal abuse could be heard through the walls. Why can't I get a memo from a friend? <clears throat> Later that night, that same presidential appointee who had received the berating called me in my little apartment on Capitol Hill and asked if I could save his job, <laughs> if I would talk to Charlie. I summoned up all of my Midwestern self-righteousness and said no, because it was already established that he was a liar. There was now a growing number of people who wanted to slap me on the back with a meat cleaver. But at least now I was in the right bureau and protected by my new friend. Until, until he got fired several months later for allegedly giving grants only to people and organizations who agreed with him politically. Even without him, I was going great guns, organizing the first round of auditions for the Artistic Ambassador Cultural Exchange Program which revolved around classical music, until I got fired. Shortly thereafter, for being implicated in the Kitty Gate scandal, which I had nothing to do with. Charlie and his deputy had hired many of the children of President Reagan's cabinet, put some in top paying jobs. Casper Weinberg Jr. was a GS-50 at the TV studios. Um, Alexander Haig's daughter worked in the front office with Charlie, Judge Clark's niece, it went on and on. And I got my old enemies in the other bureau had leaped to the Washington Post that I was Charlie's piano teacher, and so I got tied into the scandal like some guy in an attic that comes down for crumbs. <laughs> my program was given back to my enemies in the other bureau, and they asked for all the information and data accumulated so far. I refused to give it, so my files were broken into, and a security investigation ensued. I was subsequently rehired, which was like an earthquake, since I was the only appointee, I've been told, in the administration who was fired with the paperwork completed and the departure date given and then rehired. <laughs> the counselor of the agency wanted me gone within two weeks, but the director of personnel stretched out to two months hoping that I could reverse it, which I did. All of this occurred, ladies and gentlemen, all of it, within the first eight months that I was in that building. <laughs> <laughs> and I endured it for seven more years. When it was over, I was so burned out I couldn't tie my shoelaces and never wanted to wear a suit again. This is a, an exception. Uh, but now, let's catch our breath. Uh, uh, lest it, you know, seem too lurid, which, which it was. But some relief will be provided by saying that in the midst of this madness, there was humor. One of the most comedic things is to be in a meeting with a high-level person, where the with high-level people, where the atmosphere is tight. There's a certain coded protocol which everyone is expected to observe. There are thousand-dollar suits, wingtip shoes, people with many far-reaching responsibilities. Suddenly, one of them says something absurd, so ridiculous that it could be a, a line in a sitcom. But you can't laugh. And if you did, you wouldn't be able to stop. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Um, I heard this myself from lawyers. Quote, we can only bring him in if nobody knows about it and nobody pays for it. <laughs> I had a friend, uh, office private sector programs. I was in his office. He had the phone on speaker because Charlie called down. And uh, Charlie had just come back from uh, Kenya. And he had noticed that in. My friend was director of the private sector programs. Charlie thought that that meant that he raised money in the private sector. But Contrary was actually true. He gave money away in grants, but Charlie didn't know that. So he said, I want you to raise money for a film or video presentation. He said, I was in Nairobi, in Kenya, and I noticed a lot of cars that were stalled on the thoroughfares. And I want a film made of how to fix a carburetor 
so we can get that country moving again. And my friend said, moving where? <laughs> and there was a commensurate outburst, of course. Um, there was a third bureau in the agency, the Bureau of Administration, which was headed up by yet another presidential appointee. Woody had an impeccable resume, a bank executive, act, active in the party, and wrote environmental speeches for the Vice President of the United States, but there were problems upon encounter. He had a hair trigger temper, a hair weave, and a purple nose like W.C. Fields. <laughs> His staff openly advised me to schedule meetings with him in the morning since he could not remember anything that happened by the afternoon. Part of this was that he was narcoleptic and fell asleep at inappropriate times. Normally this would elicit sympathy for human beings with health problems, but Woody was in charge of the entire budget for the agency and oversaw personnel in the embassies around the world. His assistant called one day. She was a mixture of femininity and toughness. He called her the steel butterfly. A cry never. So I couldn't believe the sobs on the phone. I hurried up there and she asked me to close the door. What's the problem, Wanda? She dabbed her eyes and pointed in the direction of her boss's office and then at the secretarial pool. She said, do you see that little kid out there? That's the secretary's child. He's eight years old. She asked permission to bring him into the office because she can't find a babysitter for him and Woody said, okay. She jabbed her finger again in the direction of his office. This kid's been here all week started working the copy machines. Today the White House called and he answered the phone. <laughs> I told Woody, and you know what he said? He said, I want that kid out of here by close of business. He hasn't accomplished a damn thing. <laughs> After I was rehired, they gave me a small budget and an assistant to get my program going. Otherwise, what was the point of being rehired? But I was informed by the director's executive assistant that I could no longer rely on Director Wick for help. That I was on my own with the program, sink or swim. That way, if, he, if it failed, he wasn't involved. But if it succeeded, the credit would be shared. The first order of business were the national auditions. The late Martin Manning, the, the, the agency historian, told me that there had never been a national competition on public money in the history of government. So it was up to me. Competitions, now here we're going to get a little bit into the weeds. I don't know if anybody is a musician or they know about international or national comp piano competitions or music competitions, violin, voice, whatever. Uh, but, but bear with me. I'll try to make it as simple as I can. The, the, sele the competition selection process was in, in three stages. Because my budget was small, the first round would be a freebie to ask the deans of all graduate music schools in the country, I believe there were 125 at that time, now there are many, many more, that includes uh, Hawaii and Alaska, to nominate up to three candidates who would fit the criteria of the program. That was up to the schools, up to the departments, the dean, nominate people who could be ambassadors of culture for the United States. Presumably they knew their character and so forth. Next were the regional auditions where these nominees would be heard at various donated venues in uh, convenient physical proximity, you know, so they could easily be gotten to. I went on this leg of it, along with a critic from the New York Times. Together we chose 12 to 15 finalists to be flown back to Washington for the final round of the Coolidge Auditorium of the Library of Congress. Now, you could imagine uh, the preparation involved, and there were endless hurdles to clear, although the USIA was responsible for all cultural presentations overseas, they relied on an agreement with the National Endowment for the Arts, the latter choosing all the performing artists and the USIA sending them overseas. That didn't seem to make any sense that an agency down the street would choose the artists and we would fit the bill. <laughs> then there was the smith Munn Act, which basically forbade the agency to let the American people know what they were doing, so as to eliminate, for example, the possibility of the VOA broadcasting inward the political spiel of each incoming administration inward to the American people. Uh, and that was after World War II, Goebbels had, had done that. And 
this reaction, that sort of thing. But, but how then could we advertise the auditions? There was a way out under the Fulbright Hayes Act which broadly gave the authority to search the country for the best grantees. Then there was the problem of forming a panel of judges to adjudicate the competition. This had to be placed in the federal register, ladies and gentlemen, formed as a federal advisory committee. I could go on and on, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want your heads to spin. It was a little hair raising and made even worse by my new assistant, which I had won through my rehiring. She was already retirement at the age of 65 years, which seemed ancient to me at the time. She had nothing on her resume except recommendations from party chieftains, smoked like she was going to the electric chair, <laughs> filed everything by color, red, blue, yellow, green, typed with one finger, and when the migraines came, she would be gone for days. I had to get rid of her, but when word got out, her godfather, who was a prominent voice in the administration, called Charlie. She was to stay on the payroll, but her new job would be to periodically update the Rolodex in the outer office. <laughs> with a new assistant, I was able to get the thing started, and it went off pretty well, with no complaints from the hinterlands. When 12 finalists, American citizens all, were brought back to the Library of Congress to play the piano without any hitches, it seemed to some in the bureaucracy that this was a sort of miracle because nothing had gone wrong. There were people that would tell me in the elevator, what a great program. I'd say, well, it's only half finished. They have to go overseas. But in a new idea, you know, if you can bring up often stages where there's no felonies committed, nobody's fired, there's no disgrace in the press, hey, it's a winner. <laughs> you know? uh, it, but it came to me, you know, that I, I, I could start building support for the program. That's very important in the government, to, 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 to find coalitions and departments that, that will feel a part of the success. At the beginning, everybody was against me, but then as the thing started to turn, so did, so did the, the bureaucracy. And uh, to gain more support, I had a shuttle to take agency employees to the library over the noon hour so they could hear the auditions. That went over very well until it was canceled because some of them never came back. <laughs> the Voice of America agreed to record all the auditions and broadcast them overseas. I also threw a bone to the Foreign Service by asking two officers to interview each of the contestants only to find out if they could put a subject and predicate together. To get the temperature of the person, you know, after all, they would be giving press conferences and interviews overseas and plainly uh, representing our country. This was grassroots. They had to be up to the task. <clears throat> the Foreign Service would consult and advise with the distinguished panel of music judges, but not have a vote. Now, many of these music judges were well-known performing artists, but they didn't have a grasp of the nomenclature of the government. Some of them kept referring to the Foreign Service as the Secret Service. <laughs> do we have to do what these men say? No, I tell them no. They're only in an advisory capacity. One of the Foreign Service interviewers buttonholed me in the hallway one, one year, I remember. Uh, he said, may I speak to you for a moment? And, and you know, diplomats can be rigor rigorously appropriate and grim when necessary. I said, what is it? He said, one of the contestants, he said, we, we've been questioning him and he's, 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 he's well, he's, I said, a banana? He said, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I said, can you give me an example? Oh, he said, okay, well, he's a little older. He said, I asked him, uh, how old was he when he started the piano? And he said, the only thing he could remember about his childhood was that he was very tired. <laughs> then I asked, and that, then, then he said, then I asked him, if chosen, what countries would he like to go to? And he said, anywhere he could rest. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Otherwise, our luck uh, continued to hold through the first artistic ambassador final audition. There was one minor mishap when a pianist from Dallas got trapped underneath the stage. He banged on its famous floorboards, and some thought they heard a screen. Security came, opened an obscure trap door to the library of kind, and out he came, perspiring, profusely pale. I asked him, how, how, how did that happen? He said he was only looking for a bathroom. <laughs> I said, were you ever able to relieve yourself? He said, oh my God, I've 
forgot. <laughs> At the end of the competition, there were five soloists selected. This is the first year. The pilot, no, pilot project, if you will. And it, it, it really looked like a, a, a poster for tolerance. It would really go over today. An African American, a Sioux Indian, a woman, the boy next door type, and I found out later a closeted gay person. The Foreign Service, the culture vultures, and the press were ecstatic because it showed diversity like it, had, like it had all been planned, but it wasn't. That was indeed America. And each of these artists, although different in most respects, had one common denominator, their reach big talents. Now they had to go overseas. This was the acid test. And the embassies were a little nervous. They preferred big name artists would not embarrass them, you know, Van Cliver at that time, and so forth. And I had an altogether different criteria for the program. All candidates could not be famous, nor under management, but deserving of both. The idea was, and, and there was no age limit, by the way, which, which was unusual at the time, because all the major competitions throughout the world and in this country, the Tchaikovsky, the Chopin of Warsaw, the Nomberg over here in New York, they all had cutoff points at about 30 years of age. Well, Charlie got into the act on this. He spotted me with one of the finalists in the lobby. She was 52 years old. I introduced them and, and she said something ditzy like, oh, Mr. Wick, you look just like Richard Nixon. And his rejoinder was, I've never been president, but I have been disgraced. <laughs> <laughs> then he drew me aside. He said, what the hell's going on here? I said, I thought this program was for young people. And I was in trouble again. It was hard to breathe. I said, no, I replied, talent is the only criterion. And he said, if I knew that, I might have auditioned myself. <laughs> then he laughed and walked away. On such small moments, history can be decided as well as, as your own cardiovascular system. <laughs> we diverged on one other point. Charlie thought I should go through New York management to find the artist. His reasoning was that once I was through and the administration was over, I would know these agents and it would help me personally in my career as a performer. But I wanted it to be grassroots. New York was the power center of the arts and management. It had a stranglehold on the business. But many of our 50 states were arguably as big as some of the European countries that were the seat of Western culture. And there had to be an array of talent out in the country, not just uh, New York. Now it was D-Day. They were going overseas. The offering cables had been sent to our embassies and countries were chosen. As part of the preparation, we flew each of the artistic ambassadors back into Washington for briefings by desk officers from each of the respective countries they would be going to. Then I also gave my own personal briefing because my neck was on the block. I tried to emphasize privately that they would be representing something outside of themselves, that for many people overseas who had never had contact with an American, our country would be viewed through the prism of the artistic ambassador themselves. The responsibility for each of them would therefore be great. One of them wanted to go to a restaurant in Chinatown. So at the close of dinner, he said uh, to me, uh, John, he said, do you know why I like to live in San Francisco? I said, no, why? He said, because you can wear a dress and makeup and nobody cares. I have to say that my whole life flashed before my eyes. <laughs> you have to imagine that this was much more a sensitive issue in the United States. I couldn't help imagining him walking out on stage in a dress as if to raise the ante he had a beard. <laughs> But when he played in uh, Santiago, Chile, he got a better review than a world-famous pianist who had returned there to his homeland after an absence of 50 years. 
Gradually, we won over the embassies. All they had to do was hear these musicians play and then bask in their good reviews. Plus, the artists were unspoiled and amenable to making sacrifices in return for a scrapbook of reviews and feature stories. Our budget was small, but we nevertheless tried to take care of the mundane matters that hitherto had been thrust on the embassies. For the first time, we paid honoraria for the artists as well as per diem and international travel. This freed up the cultural attaches to do what they liked to do and did best, program the artists in depth all over each country for a period of up to two weeks before they moved on to the next, except in Brazil, where we, because of the landmass, we stayed routinely for a month. The musicians played in, in small venues, important venues, and also gave instruction and master classes in chicken farm conservatories in the provinces, thus increasing the likelihood of maximal impact. It started to work from the beginning. And the program grew in stature. Here are some newspaper accounts from those days. The Bangkok Post, quote, with artistic ambassadors like these, why does America need a naval presence? <laughs> Vercerni Novosti from, in those days, Belgrade, Yugoslavia. We do not know what our foreign minister thinks. Maybe he and all, all of us would be well served by such ambassadors. The Daily in Bombay, India, there's something uniquely special about artistic ambassadors from the U.S. The Times and Valletta Malta, with no apologies for these superlatives, may we have more of this kind of musical diplomacy. El Diario in Caracas, Venezuela, many countries such as Portugal and Czechoslovakia have become interested in copying this program and have already taken the first step toward that end. Let us hope that we too can develop a similar program to send our musicians to other countries. When Sadat ordered the Russian advisors out of Egypt, that included most of the music professors at the Cairo Conservatory. The conservatory then asked if artistic ambassadors could fill in. Could they come during springtime and give classes to get the students ready for their performing exams? We did this for years. Others around the world also started looking forward uh, to the tours. By then, most of the fun and games, the political maneuvers that I was subjected to had ceased. Nothing breeds success like success. What also helped was a solo recital that I played at the Kennedy Center, which put to rest the piano teacher thing. It showed that I was somebody who could actually do what I administrated. Kitty Gate was dead and buried. My nemesis, the presidential appointee who ended up the bureau I worked in, called me upstairs and congratulated me on the concert. He hadn't been there, but he heard about it. Then he said, nobody will be laying traps for you anymore, unquote. What a motley kind of insurance that was, assurance. But I couldn't complain anymore. My staff was increased. We moved into a suite of offices and eventually expanded the program and the auditions to include uh, chamber music, trios, duos, and so forth. This is not to say that everything was problem free. You never wanted what they called a heads up call from the embassy overseas. This was usually an employee from the embassy speaking in a sort of voce voice with assurances that it would be on the QT or off the record. Uh, what they were going to tell you, they just didn't want to put in a cake. I remember one call from the embassy in Rome. Mr. Rabelais, you can't believe everything this dame has packed. Hmm. This is years ago, of course. Dame. It's costing the embassy a fortune to cart her around. The other day she went up to Bologna by train to save airfare. She took seven hat boxes with her. Seven hat boxes on an Italian train. I tracked her down in a little mountain village. The hotel desk clerk didn't speak English very well, but he seemed to understand that I wanted to speak to the American lady who was staying there. When she came on the line, I laid it out flat. I said, this is the U.S. government calling, and you're costing the taxpayers <laughs> needless amounts of money. We've been watching you th through your travels, and you're just carrying too much stuff. We want you to send some of it back. And there was a silence, and she said, but, but, but I don't understand. I've always been a good American. I, I don't have that much. <laughs> I said, well, how many concert dresses do you have? She said, I don't have any. I said, but didn't you play a concert last night? She said, the hell I did. Listen, who is this anyway? 
I put the phone back gently on its cradle. What were the odds that there would be two American women in this little mountain hotel and I get the wrong one? <laughs> <laughs> Then there were a couple of things I had to abandon on the program. One was homestays. The culture vultures love this. How much better does cultural exchange get than being right there in the midst of family life in another culture? But the woman pianist in our first group had a negative experience, she told me in a private debriefing. She was thrilled to be hosted by a Danish count in Copenhagen until he sent his family away for the weekend and chased her around the castle for three days. She wound up locking herself in her room, and this was before cell phones. She survived because a street vendor threw sandwiches up through her window. <laughs> the second thing was commissioned musical compositions. Commissioned works. For each tour, I, I commissioned a musical composition to be written by an American composer. Somehow I got away with this without a selection process. Uh, I think it was because they were notable in, in the music world. I simply picked up the phone and then, and then we did it on the purchase order contract. And that's an experience. The first one, I had my staff fill it out, pages, and then I took it personally to, to that uh, division. And these poor women, they didn't have a cubicle or anything. They were just lined up in, in one desk after the other horizontally across this whole room. They would chat and all this kind of stuff. I walked in there and I remember I went to the one that was uh, farthest on the left toward the window. She was eating a bag of Cheetos. And I hadn't, I hadn't thought of Cheetos since I was a teenager. And I handed her the purchase contract. It was for Morton Gould, who was president of ASCAP and a Pulitzer. She said, what does he do? I said, he's a composer. She said, what's that? I said, well, he writes music. She said, well, look, this is for the equipment. The purchase contract is for a computer or a lamp. And I said, well, he's sending us equipment that's going to be used overseas to many hearts and minds. And she, she didn't say anything, but she cocked her head looked at me like, uh, come back and see me after you've landed. <laughs> so I, I, had to, I went to her supervisor, and then I had to go to his supervisor. But if you start to be a success in the bureaucracy, then people give you more leeway. So to get that first one over with, we were able to do, I think, 13 more, and it became, it became routine. Uh, however, uh, most of what they produced was these composers was in the modern contemporary classical music idiom. Um, I don't want to confuse you with too many musical terms and so forth, but I'll just say at the time, in the 1980s, there was a surge of neo-romanticism. Prior to that, for decades, there had been experimentation with pretty wild things serial, atonal, tone row, so forth and so on. But they had rediscovered normal harmony, these composers, except they didn't quite, in my view, know how to use it. So they juxtaposed it with the old system and then with the new, so that uh, it was somewhat dissonant and, 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 and was not really terribly accessible, and as Samuel Barber would have said, without a real tune. The Foreign Service was thrilled at the idea because each artistic ambassador would have a world premiere as part of the repertoire which gave these unknowns, uh, you know, cachet. And it would also showcase American culture. Oh, they were very excited until they heard the music. Morton Gould's set of piano etudes called Patterns was well received in Spain. He hadn't written piano pieces in 25 years. But most of the other music was difficult for the public to grasp. The critics either ignored it or criticized it. There was overwhelming silence out in the fields with no mention of these comp compositions in the evaluation cases. Then one came back that broke the ice. It was from a Foreign Service officer that was squirreled away on an island in the Caribbean. And we had covered that with those too. 
remember it was, it was Fred Bichetti. He said, couldn't they play some Gershwin or some Louis Moreau Gottschalk? He said, they're Americans too. And then the cruncher came when he referred to the commission piece and, and, and not obliquely either as three cats in a bag. And, and that was an interesting thing to uh, deal with these composers. Because I don't know how I can put this other than to be blunt. Some of them were flakier than even the performers. <laughs> uh, I got a one afternoon, there was a lot going on in the office, very <coughs> frenetic, the fax machines were sputtering. And I think maybe Charlie had called down, and that always sent people in a tailspin because everybody was afraid of them. And my secretary stuck her head through there. I said, Mr. Hoyby is on the phone. Lee Hoyby was one of the composers for commission. So I took the call in the midst of this chaos. He said, John, I'm sitting by the ocean, and I noticed a phone booth, and I just had to call you. There's nothing going on. There's no music in my head at all. And I'm looking at these waves, and I'm thinking, where did it go? Then, uh, Martin Gould called me. He had a uh, Brooklyn accent. He said, uh, I'm 75 years old. I'm in the middle of a divorce. She's got everything. She's got all the furniture. There's nowhere to put the phone. It's on the floor. I have no bed to sleep on. I'm a damn fool. <laughs> Holding the phone. No. And then there was another one, a younger composer. I can't remember who it was, but he didn't get the piece in on time. And that, you know, these artists had to learn the music for the tour. They needed time, and he, he was recalcitrant in that regard. So we called him for two days, couldn't get a hold of him, left a plethora of messages, finally he called back, he apologized, he said he was out looking for a baked apple. <laughs> and I said, well, you haven't sent the piece. He said, I didn't know I'll mail it tomorrow. I said, well, I couldn't think of anything to say except, did, did, did you ever find a baked apple? He said, no, I did not. So that was a two-day search. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, the Artistic Ambassador Program, as I had set it up, worked along seven more years, and during that time covered uh, 63 countries around the world and was honored in the East Room of the White House. After I left, it changed somewhat, but nevertheless managed to survive the retrenchment of two succeeding administrations until the demise of the agency. Now, I have talked about how it happened and the atmosphere in which it transpired. My book puts it all into a novelistic format, which is uh, probably more entertaining and informative than this wretched to you. But when it's over, when the, the, you know, the publicity, the receptions, the dog and pony shows, the cables, the madness, and the moving from darkness to light, well, what was it really about? Why was I even allowed to pursue a program like this? Because as you have seen, the government, <laughs> I think you get the idea, the government's really not set up for this kind of thing. Well, it had to do with the mission of the agency. Mission um, is a lofty term which meant a statement about the reason for existence, which was, quote, to tell America's story to the world, unquote, as well as to, uh, under Fulbright Hayes, provide greater understanding between peoples around the globe. Now, when I originally started the Artistic Ambassador Program, I had no idea or consequently any interest in public diplomacy. My real aim was to help the U.S. It was to, frankly, use the USIA as a vehicle to help American musicians in a field where there was a, a depression of opportunity. And, and to help revitalize the performing arts in this country. I continue to believe that had that program really extended as it logically should have into, into art and into uh, acting, uh, 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 theater, and a variety of other things, that the performing arts really could have been revitalized in a, in a, in a significant way in this country. Anyway, as I rubbed up against it, felt it, and and, and and watched it germinate, I, I came to understand its importance. 
what, what is public or cultural diplomacy? There are many definitions by people that have spent their lives dealing with the subject. Milton Cummings, Jr., Joseph Knight, and in a few, I'm leaving Richard Arndt out of it. But I would like to give my own definition using my experiences in cultural exchange as a crucible through which to understand. Generally speaking, when you have a personal encounter with someone from a foreign country, it is much harder to hate that person than large populations of people from faraway places whom you do not know, will never know, but have been told to hate. And when that person brings with them an offering of beauty, something from the arts that raises the mundane existence of the listener or the receiver, something which is life-giving and not destructive, then the positive effect is increased. And when an entire government offers this as an instrument of national policy, then it is harder to go to war against them. It is almost a mystical thing because the impact is interior, long term, and cannot be quantified like many of the hard sciences. We are all human. When you prick us, we bleed. Our hearts can be broken. And we all go through triumphs and tragedies in this life. So when people who do not share the same language, pray in the same way, or even look the same, are in a hall listening to great music that strikes a respondent chord in their memory bank of emotions, nobility, sadness without hopelessness, spontaneous joy, interior peace, they share a bond that cuts through that lack of commonality. They are in community with each other. For example, when an American plays a nocturne of Chopin, with all its French charm and Polish melancholia, then somehow at that moment, the enemy's paradigm of America is punctured. America does not seem rapacious, aggressive, and imperialistic. This is called public diplomacy, a sophisticated way to influence foreign policy and to do psychological reorganizing of attitudes and ideas. But it's also a way to bring people together. President Eisenhower once said, Quote, all that arms can do is give you a relative feeling of security, and I don't care how many guns and planes and ships you pull up, but only as we get a common basis in believing in each other, then do you have security. Is it any surprise that President Eisenhower founded the United States Information Agency, which was singly responsible for public diplomacy on behalf of the United States? Every American generation has experienced rises of national security, whether from civil wars, imperialism, fascism, communism, or religious fanaticism breeding terrorism. Each crisis proves different and yet the same, requiring physical and moral resoluteness while struggling to maintain support in the world community through great alliances, treaties, leagues of nations, and the United Nations. But a corollary battle also rages for understanding and acceptance in the world community. Cor ad cor locutor, heart speaks to heart. As when a nation explains itself by its actions or through diplomacy or by its own people simply acting out their lives. It is the latter that may be the most authentic and have the greatest long range impact in terms of mutual understanding. Therein lies the role of cultural exchange. And when great music is wedded to cultural exchange, it transforms that level of understanding into a realm that is beyond understanding, the human spirit. As Plato said, music gives a soul to the universe, wings to the imagination, and life to everything. Bringing it even closer to that source of life is Thomas Carlyle, who said simply, musica es lingua angelorum, music is the speech of angels. Thank you. Thank you, John. And ladies and gentlemen, we were going to have a little bit of a, a discussion here about some aspects of the cultural diplomacy, but maybe we can begin this by uh, uh, by starting out uh, with some questions from the floor. Yes. I read your book, but I don't remember. Did the man who needed a rest get on the tour? 
pianist who said he wanted to go go somewhere where he could rest? No. Uh, no, he didn't. Uh, the paradox was that he gave a terrific audition. He gave he played, I think, one of the best uh, scarbos I ever heard from Gaspar Lee. Mm -hmm. But there were these other issues, and the, the judges listened to, to, to these diplomats who had interviewed him. They didn't have to, but they did. It was, it was a bit sad, really. It's been all right for a public concert, but there were other aspects to this that might have been problematic. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, my name is John Lindbergh. I've known John Robletti since uh, he arrived at USIA and was there in the legal office. So it's more of a comment than a question, but maybe there's a question in here. Uh, I want to thank John for all that he did at USIA in spite of all the challenges uh, and there were many, and I want to thank him for helping save my sanity in the USI, to the extent I had any, because I too saw what he saw, that we share a Midwestern background and a similar sense of humor. Uh, that may be, a, don't sue me for slander, John, but um, <laughs> some of it was so bad it was very, very funny. Uh, today, uh, the Trump administration has proposed massive cuts to the Fulbright Exchange Program. Uh, for FY18, it was 47%. For FY19, it was 71%. And for FY20, it was 54%. I don't know what it was. It is for the next fiscal year. These cuts would have virtually eliminated the program. So, John, I appreciate your comments on the value of cultural exchanges and specifically musical exchanges. And any other thoughts you have on this would be appreciated. Maybe you have said what you want to say. But again, thanks for all that you've done and for writing this book. Well, unfortunately, we're living in a time when uh, public diplomacy and the arts in general are receding certainly classical music. A lot of the uh, radio stations around the country have folded. A lot of record labels have folded. A lot of my colleagues are paying for their own recordings for mainly uh, public relations value because they don't sell too many anymore. And one could argue the culture generally is going south. Uh, I knew Senator Fulbright and I like to tell this story because it was the first day that I came into the U.S. Army. The very first day, I was coming up the escalator at the Metro. What was it? Uh, what was that federal? What was that stop? Uh, the old uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah. Yeah. And I stopped and I asked someone. I said, "Do you know where the United States?" information agency is, and somebody behind me said, do you have some information to give? <laughs> and it was Senator Fulbright. Uh, he was no longer Senator. But I got to know him, I'd seen him on other occasions when uh, uh, the mayor of Nantes, France, came and was honored at, a, at a, uh, some to do the, the, the oh, I'm forgetting, the, the, oh, Experiment in International Living. He was uh, an, 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 an executive in that organization. He was the mayor of Nantes. He'd been a resistance fighter during the war. And I knew him from the concerts I played over there. And Senator Fulbright was the principal speaker of this thing in Washington. And there was, uh, there he was. And so I saw the senator on that occasion too. And I really got to know him so that we recognized each other. All right, now to your point. Uh, you know, What you have in um, representation in government is pretty much a reflection of the American people. 
and uh, more or less, mostly more. And I think for an appreciation of really deeply human values, I think the culture has to be willing to recognize the importance of it, the importance of that and also of beauty, the necessity for beauty in people's lives. Not just their 401ks or their own personal security. I think we're a little too alienated with that from each other. Well, beauty is, uh, and, and art in general, as Chesterton has written in his great book, The Everlasting Man, is a reflection of the soul. And, and this is a, a huge problem insofar as our culture has such a materialistic element to it, which is reflected in our foreign policy. Uh, I like to say that, there, that if it isn't guns and rockets and boxes of cash or the diplomacy concerning those things, it's not strategically important in Washington. And what we're talking about here is relations with other people and creating bonds with them that have to do with uh, the spiritual dimension of man. And, and it's precisely what you were talking about, uh, about, about creating some kind of a bond with others at this level uh, that, that isn't always easily uh, explicable, uh, but which is, the, which is the end result of, of this type of, of diplomacy. And I, uh, uh, I think that this is something that our government uh, has long needed to emphasize more, but that it requires radical structural and cultural reform within, within the government in order to do this kind of thing. Um, there has to be a demand. Well, there, there has to be a demand, but it is also the kind of thing, I believe, where, where leadership can make a difference. Look, you exercised leadership. You came with a project, with a good idea. You had to uh, battle against the forces of continuity and bureaucratic inertia, uh, which are natural forces within the government. Uh, it's, it's part of the, 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 normal, uh, uh, the normal conduct of government business is a, is a tension between forces of continuity represented by the bureaucracy and the forces of change represented by the president and his or her political appointees who are responsive to the public's desire for change. And the two sides will struggle with one another until, and, and if the desire for change is strong enough and there's enough conviction and there's enough uh, energy of the kind that you exercised, then a change can take place. And, uh, and, and so I think this is a matter of leadership, and I think it's a matter for those who are at the helm of our foreign policy to exercise that leadership. I think that if we have a Secretary of State who would put a premium on this kind of thing and try to ram it through, we would, we would, uh, we would have it. And, and I know, for example, in this administration, uh, or whatever one may think about uh, different aspects of it, that there have, there are voices in leadership positions uh, in in uh, in the State Department, for example, who who are sympathetic to public diplomacy in general. Uh, but it, you know, we it, the first Secretary of State who came in seemed to be hell bent on cutting the budget radically. Uh, and, and that's the result of, uh, you know, and I think that these budget figures that you cited about the radical uh, cuts in the Fulbright program budget were the result of those in initial decisions made by Secretary Tillerson. Anyway, um, John, I'm just wondering uh, if, if um, uh, what, if, if you see any other dimension to this kind of, well, to solving this kind of a problem. Well, I think, again, it, it, you mentioned the soul. Well, of course, that's the, that's the epicenter of everything. 
But I think, it, again, it goes back to uh, the formation of the, the culture. The culture is the water you swim in. I don't personally believe there is much leadership. I think we're bereft of it in every single discipline in our society. When you, you compare today to the great personalities of years ago, great public speakers, people that could say things that were memorable that we still quote today, people <coughs> that could move an entire nation with the bully pulpit, presidents and the likes. Uh, we don't have it. We don't have it in, in law. We don't have it in education. And one could argue in the church. Uh, and let's say in the entertainment industry. Uh, can you imagine you remember the impersonators in show business years ago, the Rich Littles and the Frank Gorshins and so forth. Who would they imitate today? How would you imitate George Clooney or Brad Pitt? You know, it's all craftsmanship. It's sort of homogenized and so forth. Where are these larger-than-life people that inspire uh, uh, admiration? And, and, and where are our heroes? Who do our children look to? This is, of course, you're raising. I mean, you are you are raising John here a a, a huge problem about the overall culture, uh, and and we have been going through basically a deconstructionist period intellectually and culturally in this country for a very long time. Uh, I, I happen to think that some of that dissonant music to which you referred was part of that deconstruction and was a reflection of some serious problems in the souls of the people who were composing it. Uh, I think that uh, dissonance can work, and we've seen how dissonance has worked in, 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 the, in the compositions of, of earlier composers who who learned ultimately to come to, to harmonious resolution where, where the, the dissonance transforms itself into harmonious resolution. And people like Chopin and even Beethoven and others were, were, were masters of doing some of this kind of thing. But um, uh, they, the, there, there have been so many different forms of degradation. When you talk about heroes, we have historical revisionism, which is replete with dishonesty in this country, and uh, and people uh, who were part of the founding of this country are now denigrated, uh, in spite of the fact that they created a magnificent political order, uh, and and so it's it is it's a pervasive problem. Sebastian, yeah, I. Uh... I had this question from the beginning of the presentation because I thought that performance, the first word that came to me when I listened to it was, a, it was an incredibly patient performance. And I feel that I taught acting in, in New York for about six years at university and I had my own problems with Dr. Ramel's about with the impatience of, of people going into the arts right now, that there's a, there's a pace of advancement or there's a pace with, at which they want to master the art that is incredibly impatient. And I... I feel that, well, I, I would like to ask, what can be done about that um, that very fast rolling ball down the hill right now that it's so difficult to stop because they're almost addicted to immediate gratification and you do not, you do not get to be an artist that way. Well, that's right, but if you don't understand what an artist is, it's very hard to pursue the proper avenue to become something which you don't know about. Uh, in the old, you're quite right, in the old days, uh, you know, well, in, in the old studio system, you know, I mean, one of, one of the greatest, uh, I, I think, one of the things that has the greatest impact on people overseas that America has exported is the cinema. It has established, uh, <laughs> whether rightly or wrongly, it has established behavioral patterns. 
for people, or how they think they should act. And a lot of those actors uh, were, were started out in B pictures, in small roles, and they were gradually, depending on how you know they learned and how successful they were, the, the studios were like families. They uh, brought them up through the ranks, so to speak. It was the same with, with great entertainers. You look back to the great comedians. They were brought up through burlesque, through vaudeville. They learned what worked, what didn't work. It wasn't overnight. And these guys were iconic and classic. And you're quite right, today everybody wants, you know, if you win an international competition, that started with Van Cliver in 1958, you know, he was 23 years old, and he won the Moscow competition. And he was catapulted overnight because it was at the height of the Cold War. And, uh, but, and, and uh, Abram Chase's wrote a biography of him, a biography of a 23-year-old. Uh, he was on Time Magazine, he was on Person to Person with Edward Murrow, everybody wanted him, but he had no repertoire. He, he didn't know that many pieces, and he was in demand to play every third day all over the world. He was capable, in other words, overnight, and he wasn't ready. And he suffered a great deal because of that, and one could argue that he never really got over it. So, what is the answer to that? There isn't one. I mean, it's global communications, everything is quicksilver, technology. Um, uh, you can learn information on the internet immediately. You know, if you have a question about something, you can Google it. And uh, everything is fast today. And, uh, and success comes fast too because uh, telecommunications are such that everybody can see you. You know, on YouTube, you can go viral. A lot of people dream about that. But uh, they're not tried and tested. So they're, they're, they're like Quicksilver. Sir. Hello, I'm uh, Kirk Kloon. I'm a doctoral student at IWP. I'm curious about your um, you're leading a part of the symphony of public diplomacy. Can you talk about how your program and your artist integrated with the other parts of the symphony and with the other traditional diplomacy efforts? And what were the key tools of synchronization with those other, other, other players? I wasn't uh, I wasn't terribly conscious of the other aspects, and I didn't try to complement them. I tried to create something that was unique. Actually, the Foreign Service in the post had been doing that sort of thing for years. They a lot of them, the Lions, you know, the PAOs, the Hans Tux in Berlin, and so forth. They had their favorites. They kept their fingers finger in the pulse of the cultural life around them. There were Americans that were on Fulbrights that were studying at Hochschulers in Germany that they could call on for representational events, you know, very good pianists and so forth and so on. All I did was open it up to the whole country and try to look for the best and screen them, you know, and pay for it at this end so they didn't have to. And uh, I never agreed with a lot of the symphony. I didn't agree with the National Endowment for the Arts, for example, that would throw a grant at somebody to write an opera and it was never performed, or once, maybe. The way they auditioned for the USIA before I came along with these live auditions was, was with reel-to-reel uh, -reel tapes. And in some cases, they didn't even know these people, or there was politics involved, and they did know them and kept sending out the same ones. But the Pope, that when I went on official trips overseas, a lot of the, uh, uh, the people on the ground were not happy with what they had been getting, or the way it was given to them. And that was one of the reasons that my program was a success, because I did the opposite of what they did. So, I wasn't in sync so much with the rest of the symphony. I heard my own 
mute melodies. <laughs> Kurt, that, that, um, uh, I think that that is the job, really, of um, conductors of the orchestra. I mean, it's, it's really important that people who are, are playing, so to speak, their individual instrument, such as those in charge of cultural diplomacy, you should understand how it integrates. And, and of course, uh, John's concluding comments about how uh, sharing beauty with foreign audiences uh, captures people's hearts, how it, um, and, and one could be a little more Machiavellian about this, one could say that it, it softens up an audience in order to make that audience more receptive to listening to political messages that may follow. But it, it is uh, you know, an important part of, of, of cultural diplomacy is precisely getting people to break down the barriers that they erect uh, to prevent themselves from listening to people whom they don't trust, whom they don't like, whom they suspect, whom they hate. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden, if if they are exposed to beauty, if they are, they will. Uh, that those attitudes can change, and and, it, and therefore it's it is the job, for example, of the ambassador, the head of the country team in a given country, who may be sensitive precisely to the impact of an artistic ambassador, to then be able to uh, to approach, perhaps those who were exposed to this in, in a way that could have a more positive political effect. Uh, I, um, uh, one of the favorite things I like to talk about in my class when I discuss this is how the Soviets uh, during the Cold War uh, invested more in anti-American propaganda in the Indian subcontinent than any place else in the world. And they were remarkably successful uh, in, in, in doing this, this anti-American propaganda. And then the USIA sent uh, one of the college choirs, I think it was the Princeton Choir, to New Delhi. Uh, and this group of young people sang beautiful songs. Now what was the image of the United States in the uh, in the minds of, of, of so many people in, in India. Well, uh, remember India is the most religious country in the world. Uh, and of course, we, here we in America, as the great sociologist of religion, Peter Berger, has said, the Indians are the most religious, the Swedes are the most irreligious, and in America we have been historically a very religious country, uh, you know, a country of Indians uh, led by a governing class of Swedes. <laughs> but um, the, uh, here, the image in the Indian mind was of uh, Americans as a secular, materialist, rapacious, exploitative, capitalist, uh, aggressive, imperialist power uh, that was not really could not be subject to any level of admiration. And, uh, and here these people come and sing something, songs that are beautiful. And, and of course, the beauty is the reflection of the soul. Uh, we are sending a message to the Indians that, uh, that there is a spiritual dimension in, 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 in many Americans' hearts, and that we're not simply materialist and rapacious and aggressive, and that perhaps there's something else about our country that is worth something. And all of a sudden, I mean, that concert had the political impact of a tactical nuclear weapon. And, 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 and it made it so that the, the people exposed to this could very, you know, could very well be more likely to negotiate with us, talk with us, listen to us, be sympathetic to what we have to say, and so on and so forth. But that has to be, you know, a conductor uh, of the orchestra <coughs> has to do this, uh, and to make sure that there are political messages that follow, and that there are personal relationships that are developed with some of the people who are exposed to this. Yes, ma'am. 
have. So uh, before I pose my last question. Oh, okay. Before I pose my question to uh, Dr. Rabelevi, I wanted to say that yes, uh, we have been to your concert before, and in fact, your your excellent presentations. But my question to you is this: uh, Have you felt influenced by um, Ignacy Pan? Jan Paderewski, who was a musician and a statesman, um, in actually forming your program. Uh, was I influenced by Paderewski? Yes, since he, in fact, was a pianist and a statesman. I was very influenced by Paderewski. I have great admiration for him. He is responsible, in my view, for a free Poland. After the First World War, for the first time in 200 years, he lobbied Woodrow Wilson and uh, 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 Lloyd George at uh, Versailles, personally lobbied them. Uh, Clemenceau said he was the greatest man he'd ever met, and then became uh, Prime Minister of the First Free Poland for about, about three years after that. Gave up his concert career for those three years. And he very much believed in cultural exchange and in uh, uh, music as a way of, of reaching people uh, through barriers. I may add that Paderewski uh, did some considerable concertizing in our own White House, uh, eight blocks south of here. Uh, and, uh, and President Wilson had brought him in there. And, uh, and of course, his ability to impart beauty uh, and artistic excellence uh, in, in, in the White House context could not but have had a very powerful impact upon the president and his attitude towards, uh, towards the Poles. I might add I was very privileged to play on his piano at the Polish Embassy on, on a number of occasions. And uh, uh, he was actually uh, you know, he was buried initially at Arlington National Cemetery by order of Franklin Roosevelt, who said that uh, he should remain there until Poland was once again free. And then with the advent of Solidarity and Lech Walesa, he went back, his body was taken back, and, and General Edward Rowney was the one that accompanied it back to, and there was a state funeral in Warsaw. Well, John, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, and I'd like to thank those on our uh, YouTube audience uh, for uh, tuning in to this. And uh, we hope to see you here at future lectures at IWP. Have a great evening.